Chapter 19 The Cat That Never Died Miracles, whispered T. Hammond. Miracles happen to those who believe. I tried to speak, but there was only drool. Shh, whispered T. Hammond. You're doing fine. It's always rough coming out, and pretty soon those spasms will stop. I was relearning everything. Speech, vision, and even control of my fingers weren't the same. Moving ahead, I couldn't stop my skull from rattling against the wheelchair. My teeth got hold of my hair and began to chew through the strands, splitting them inside my mouth. T. Hammond lifted my head and put a towel between my teeth, but my jaw refused to ease. I was relearning everything like a toddler fresh out of the womb. The entire body had become unfamiliar to this world, and yet every muscle was firing at maximum capacity. I know you won't see it now, but I think those spirits are miracles, said T. Hammond. Mine got me this job, and I'd be dead without it. How? How could that thought come to be? He knew nothing, and neither did this body. My process of learning shifted back to observing. Yes, this is something I'm good at, but why won't my body stop? A new extractor wearing the same skin-tight black suit and copper mask came beside me with an electric razor. Shaving the sides of my head raw, the razor jumped across my skull as I shook, but he forgot to trim the top. He left a mess above my head as if to highlight the inner madness bursting out. This next part is quick, whispered T. Hammond. Again I learned to twist my neck. There he was smiling next to me, wiping the jewel from my chin. T. Hammond was a very convincing man. For as bad as my situation appeared to be, the suffering took no toll on him. He was cheerful and patient, not like the others they called extractors. They call this the black mask, and it doesn't even hurt one bit, said T. Hammond. The black mask? It's just different, that's all. And I'd even say it makes things better, said T. Hammond. You know, I wore the black mask once, too. I even saw all six moons, said T. Hammond. All six? What was he talking about? He held my hand while they pressed my head back against the wall. I was stuck, captive in the wheelchair, when one extractor came to me and held the black mask up before pressing it over my face. There were no holes for my eyes or nose. All I felt was the warm breath entering through the mouth hole when T. Hammond used the mouth. Breathe through the mouth, said T. Hammond. Good. Now a big exhale. Yes, there was an opening for my mouth and I could breathe. I was learning how to breathe air in past my lips and into my lungs. Every breath was deep and heavy as I searched for more air. And even though I was trapped behind this darkness, I felt like a baby waiting in the mother's womb. Oh, I was safe. Then I felt a metal tube inserted into my mouth when my eyelids clawed against the mask in a panic. Deep breath now, said T. Hammond. I was out of breath when someone sparked a lighter before I inhaled. What else was I to do? I'd already released my breath, and even a dying man fights for oxygen, too. They pulled the mask off, for I saw a smoke cloud pour out from my mouth. The body needs air, so what else could I do? It was silent and perfect while I sat there terrified as a smoke cloud grew. After everything was out, I took a new breath in, and then sparkling dots pierced my vision before I saw six moons flashing within. All my sight disappeared. No sense mattered. I remembered how six moons flickered, then burst and shattered. This was not a dream. It was far more intense, but I'd surrendered to the vision since it was beyond any sense. But if I had died, then why can I hear the voice in my head? If I'm thinking these thoughts, I'm certain I'm not dead. My eyes were closed and all my senses were off, but the tunnel of energy grew, and that's when I saw a horse, prancing with brown and yellow light, galloping with tremendous force. As troubling as she appeared to be, the horse began to sprint, but this force was no horse. She was the mother within. Yes, it was her. This was a womb all along. I was watching the goddess sing, and this energy was her song. Even though my eyes were blank, I was watching her dance, sitting at her lotus feet. I watched half alive in a trance. Not a word was spoken, but I felt all her love. And then she started to slip away, when she slipped away up above. But before she went, she let me peek at the end. But before I could visit her abundance, I watched her colors begin to bend. It went black before blue. Now a triangle appeared in the night. The black was sucking up my essence as if she were taking back my light. It was pitch black and empty, only stillness in my mind. Then I opened my eyes when they handed me a contract to sign. But where had I gone? She was with me back then. But after I inhaled the white vapor, well, where had I been? I'm not sure if I'll see you again, said T. Hammond. But whatever happens, you'll need to sign these papers. That smoke. Where did I go? They call it DMT, said T. Hammond. I think it's a meeting with God.
but the king is certain it's a mind eraser, said T. Hammond. I was trapped in this body, chained to the place I didn't belong. I closed my eyes to seek this mother, but the goddess was gone. I spent a day or so behind my eyelids until I became awake to see things had only gotten worse. They'd left me in a cell, four walls without windows, when a man with blue eyes was staring back at me. He was an extractor wearing a copper mask, and he was checking to see if I signed those papers. He left me in that room, but not before tying my body to the chair. He chained me in front of a television screen, but there were no instructions when he turned it on. A video began playing, and terror flashed before my eyes, and the more I watched the screen, the more I began to cry. Now, I won't tell you what I saw, because the screen was worse than the papers. And if they wanted me to sign that contract, then why'd they let those men rape her? These films were dreadful. Now I saw a donkey explode. They tied a man to a truck's bumper and took off speeding down the older road. Torture came into my sight, burning bad memories in my head. Everyone on this screen was dying, and pretty soon I'd be dead. I checked with my hands to make sure my head was on tight, but I was tied to the chair and something in my mind wasn't right. Even my hair was missing, except the top was still long, and that's when I realized something awful had happened and this was all terribly wrong. Someone in black came to check on me. I cried about the screen, but the extractor didn't say a word when I noticed his eyes were green. Now he began to beat me and I don't know why. He never spoke a word, but I knew he wanted me to die. It would always hurt the same. Maybe I was coming up from a dream, but this morning I woke up and nothing was as it seemed. Someone locked me in a cell, with pages scattered all about. Blood was everywhere and it was dripping from my mouth. Someone had beaten me. This nightmare was too real. My body was trembling because this pain might not heal. My finger was broken. It was bent past the knuckle. And every time I tried to stand, my knees started to buckle. I was dying every moment, panicking each day, and they were killing people on that screen, and I was dying either way. This time an extractor came in with his hand on a gun. I fled to the corner, but there was nowhere to run. With my knees to my chest, he pointed it between my eyes. Was today the day, the very first time I die? He wanted my signature, but I wouldn't touch the pen's grip. I wasn't giving up because there was no way I'd quit. My family was around here somewhere, and his mask was missing a smile by the mouth. He pointed his gun to the wall and fired a few rounds out. A bullet broke through the cell when a burst of sunlight flew through the crack. A brave ray of orange light was shining on my back. Curled in a ball, I looked to the light. If there was any hope left, then at least the sun was bright. Now there's something I have to tell you. I think there's something you ought to know. When I inhaled the white smoke, I met the essence of our soul. I'm talking about pure love and light, a place beyond the human eyes. And when I saw that sunlight poke through the wall, it gave me hope not to cry. I can't explain the feeling. I couldn't even tell you why. But the more they beat me, the more the orange light wouldn't die. When I woke up the next day, they escorted me down a hallway in cuffs and chains. After a few steps, my legs gave out, so they dragged me the rest of the way, while red drops of blood followed my heels. Seated in a new room, I collapsed in a chair while a man came to interrogate me. And wait. I recognized this place. It was the same white walls where many of the victims on the screen had died before. Cameras were mounted all around and I could see how they captured the videos. The bloodstains had been wiped away, but the scent of death still lingered below my bare feet. He was a real man who entered the room. No copper mask and no black jumpsuit. He sat down in the chair across from me. He didn't hit me, not like the extractors, but his words sure had something to say. He mocked my mother, then he cursed my father too. And while I waited for the final moments in my life, a terrible sadness drove me blue. My family, I cried. He took a gun out and set it on the table between us when he stood up. It's do or die, he whispered. Your choice. He turned his back and clicked a button while a red dot on the camera started recording. Oh, I'm so sorry, Otto. I didn't mean to mess up. And Manuka, would she ever understand? Levi and Jane, they're still inside too. Now the man's tone changed. He spoke softer than before. He was preaching peace as if he wanted to help me. He said we could get along. This man was pleading for an agreement when he said we were in this together. But he was a liar, lying right to my face. My arm twitched. Wait, my hands weren't chained. They hadn't locked me to the seat, and so I leapt on the table. My fingers latched onto his gun. Die! I pointed. He jumped back, but there was nowhere to go. The door was closed behind him, and this gun was ready to blow. Please don't do it, yelled the man. Please don't shoot me. I want to help. I'm here to help. 
I pulled the trigger, but nothing happened. I pulled it again. Nothing. The door opened, and many extractors entered on cue. The man clicked the button, and the red light on the camera stopped blinking. It only took a moment until they raised their batons to beat me before my vision went black. Now I know what you're thinking. If I wasn't dead, then I shouldn't be awake, but this time I woke up tied to a chair in an irreversible state. A bone had split through my leg. The mirror was poking on through, because no skin stands a chance when the beatings break pieces inside of you. I was back in the cell, tied to a chair, but at first it helped because there was a fluffy kitten right there. Blinking my eyes, she sat in my sight. But how had she gotten here, and what a pleasant little delight. We waited for a bit, but it wasn't the kitten that had to cry. I was weeping when I saw the orange light changing into darkness, signaling the beginning of the night sky. The bullet hole stopped glowing. Both of us were doomed, and even this little kitten was afraid when the thunder first boomed. She ran to my chair, then she jumped on my lap, and we talked all night, and I learned a lot about life as a cat. Psst, said a voice. Huh? Psst, you there? Someone was at my door. Psst, can you hear me? Who's there? Are you okay in there? whispered a voice under my door. I tried to turn my head, but my neck was on too tight. I'm a Mowgli, but something's not right. Who are you? They call me Cicero. I've been a prisoner for, well, I don't know how long. I can't remember when I came in, but I made a run for it. Open my door, please. I wish I could, said Cicero, but my cell wasn't like yours. Mine had bars, not a door with a lock. And once they stopped feeding me, I got so thin that I squeezed through. Staring into the television, I saw ropes tied around a dog's limbs before they stretched the Don't puppy. say that, said Cicero's voice under the door. Death is not the end. It is where our journey begins. You know the secret, don't you? Secret? W what secret? A flash of lightning burst before the thunder roared. No matter how dark it gets, the darkness can't swallow our light, said Cicero. Lightning flashed again, and I saw the bolt ricochet through the tiny hole in the wall. I waited for the words to register, but all I felt was the pain echoing through my limbs. There's no hope left, not when you're this close to the end. Wait and see, said Cicero. That's how we win. The kitten meowed. Is that the kitten with you, said Cicero? You know her. Of course. Has she told you about the rumors? Oh, she must have told you. No, nothing. What rumors? There's a hero who walks among us, half human and half divine. But before he can save us, he has to discover how light shines, said Cicero. Where? The cat meowed when I heard footsteps echo through the walls. I have to go, but things will change, said Cicero. Wait and see, then you'll believe me. I heard him scamper away, and all I could think about was the 28th psycho pump. Somewhere I pictured its cloak, and those big antlers too. Because once I died, I knew the psycho pump would rescue me too. When I woke up, the television was off, but a box was waiting in the center of the room. Secured and tied shut with rope, something was moving inside. A paw reached through the box. The softest meow broke the silence. It was the kitten trying to talk. Let the cat go, I said as loud as I could. It's just a kitten. Bones scratched my insides with every breath, but no one came to help. I cursed and I screamed until my tears ran dry, because for the next three sunrises, even the little cat had nothing left to cry. When an extractor did arrive, he put a needle in my arm and forced liquid into my veins. Not even my own weeping could mute the things I feared most. I prayed I'd die before the kitten did, but after the last sunrise, the paws finally stopped trying. Logic would tell you that the kitten died that day, but life isn't about logic. The 28th psycho pump never came, and that's how I knew the kitten never passed. Another sunrise came before a smaller extractor with brown eyes came into my cell holding a stack of papers. The note hadn't changed when I read, Sign it. He didn't care for my silence, and so he turned the screen back on. And if there was ever a time for a plan, then this was it. I'd been watching the very worst things, half crazy, half alive, but this was my best idea, so I had to give it a try. Do you feel strong beating a man who's tied up? What about a fair fight? The extractor pressed his helmet against my face when I felt the copper pennies against my head. In God We Trust was imprinted in front of my eyes. He untied my head and body from the seat. Fair fight. Not quite. I fell to the ground, but none of it mattered because I had a plan. I checked the edge of my nail, and it was the sharpest one I had. Could it do the job? Well, I guess we'll see.
He charged forward and I didn't even try to fight back. The extractor launched me across the room when I tumbled to the far corner. He waited for me to stand. Now was my chance. I didn't have much time, and so I dug the nail into my eye socket and ripped my left eye out. A white ball holding my brown iris rolled across the floor. Blood poured over my face, but before I could rip my other eye out, he caught on to what I was doing and tied my hands behind my back. Do you know what's worse than losing your sight? Losing half, because now you have to watch the damn screen again. They tied me to the table and wheeled me through the ugly teal corridor. They brought me into a new room and put me on an operating table. A lamp came on and the darkness vanished when I saw a light of a thousand suns overhead. I was losing it when a doctor wearing blue came to my side. Oh my, he paused. How could God command it? My tortures were silent while the doctor leaned over me to examine my missing eye. Did God command this? he whispered to the extractors. The extractors nodded, and so the doctor began sewing my eye socket shut. Watching him through my right eye, I looked up and begged, Medicine, please, he kept sewing, Plazopram. He looked back to the other extractors, but not a single one moved. Give it! Bobbing back and forth through consciousness, the needle sailed through my eyelid. I knew I was gone, but then I realized that all these men would die too. I can't do it. He won't survive the night, said the doctor. Yes, now I understand, because I saw how it works. By a blade or a bullet, every death hurts. The man in blue hadn't even looped the last stitch when a wave of darkness pulsated through pain. I turned my head sideways so my bad eye socket could drain. Still in the darkness, I waited to leave this body when they left me alone. Then out of the corner of my eye, I saw a single extractor emerge from the darkness. His hand snuck onto the table and grabbed the scissors. Concealing the sharp metal tool, he looked down into my good eye. Two orange irises were staring back. Please, I thought. Do it. He leaned forward, and his ID badge swung over me as he cut the last strand hanging from my eye. I looked up to read his badge. They'd given him the number 28, and it was printed beside the words of his name, General Extractor, T. Hammond. He was waiting for something, and I sensed he liked those scissors. Please, T. Hammond, end it. I thought, and I wouldn't look away, not if this was my finale on my very last day. I would never command this, not what they put you through. I don't care if you sign those papers, because I'll never forget you, whispered T. Hammond. Kill me, Shh. whispered the air in T. Hammond's voice. I'm trying to get you out, but you need to hold on a little longer. T. Hammond rolled me out of the room where a new set of extractors took over. They wheeled me back to my cell while I stared back at my last friend. I couldn't fathom the thought of waking up, not one more day, and so I closed my eye, hoping death would find its way. There's always a choice, and even with T. Hammond's plan, I couldn't do it. I wouldn't sign anything. Whatever they wanted from me, I'd never give it to them. And I thought I was dead, but then the king entered my cell and waved the extractors to my side. Blocking the sunlight through the hole in the wall, he put a set of razor blades in my left hand and squeezed my fingers tight. Blood was not dripping, it was pouring, and then a scream shook the halls when I heard the devil roaring. The blades disappeared into my palm, and it was worse than deep. My body began to shudder before tears began to weep. I couldn't let go, but I wouldn't hang on. Everything is impossible when they're making you hold on. T. Ammond, I screamed. Help me, I begged. My teeth started crackling because the body wouldn't quit. I had to do something, and all I could do was grab hold of my very own grip. My fingers squeezed around the pen, and... T. Hammond! I screamed. They held the papers under the pen, then the ink drew a line. But I swear I'm telling you the truth. I swear to God I didn't sign. I never wrote my name. It was just a stupid line. The razor blades fell, blood rushing out, and all the men left the room. Static hummed from a speaker. Someone was listening from the other side while I lay in a pool of blood on the floor. What do you want? I begged. I want you to tell the truth, said the king's voice through the intercom. Tell me how selfish you are. You'd do anything to save yourself, wouldn't you? said the king. Look at you. You let a newborn animal die. Why wouldn't you save it? asked the king. Static hummed through my mind. Oh, you're the most selfish person I ever met. I bet you'd hurt your own family to walk free, wouldn't you? Of course you'd do it. I bet you'd even torture them if you had to. That's how sick you are, yelled the king. Say it! You made me do this to you, yelled the king. The intercom stayed silent, but the static told me he was listening. Where's Jane? She's with us, laughed the king to the speaker. After you ran away, she needed someone to console her. 
She cried for you, many nights in fact, but now she sleeps beside my men. Lies. She thinks you're dead. So how could I let you go? asked the king. A new voice interrupted the speaker, sending chills down my spine. And what if I gave you a choice? asked Eval. What if I told you you could change your circumstance entirely? How would you choose then? I knew his voice because I remembered his golden mask. Evil continued, and this choice is nothing unreasonable, it's murderer, I interrupted. Oh, spare me the assumptions. Have you ever seen me kill anyone? said Evil. I saw the screen. And what crime did you see me commit? Murder? Rape? Abuse? Tell me, son. What am I guilty of? I never hurt a soul. Oh no, not me. I simply give the people a choice, and they make their decisions all on their own. See, I'm not against you. I am for the people. And I came here to make sure that everyone appreciates the life they've been given. Now let's think about this. You made choices in your life, and those choices brought you here. I think it's time you take responsibility for your actions. Now does that sound fair? Said Evil. He was using love against me, but I didn't need love's bullshit because the screen taught me to love hate. Everyone knows how pain hurts, said Evil. And they say how death is so very bad. Yet I find it repulsive, because we need both to appreciate the life that we have. If you want pleasure, then I bring the world its pain. How else could flowers grow if they never saw the rain? It's written in our agreement, the sole contract on this earth. But the only way the soul can feel anything is if the body agrees to a birth. And if you want to be born, then death is on its way. I'm here to give you a choice, and I'll even let you die today, said Evil. I waited while footsteps came through the hallway before Evil entered the room beside me. The orange sunlight was fading through the hole in the wall. I'm going to untie you now, and then you'll get to choose what happens next, said Evil. The orange light was turning black when darkness began swallowing my cell. I made my choice long ago, and I choose to embody the fear again and again. I have to. See, death makes life a real terror, and I enforce it the very best I can. It's because of me that you even have a choice, said Evil. Yes, there's only one choice left, and it's quite simple, really. Die, or wait around and let death do it for you, said Evil. Chapter 20 Something Small Trying to Save Us All A Mowgli, said a voice buzzing outside the hole in the wall. Who is that? I said as loud as I could. Over here. It was night while the screen blared horrors of tragedy when a hawk cried out over the land. I heard it screech when a little ladybug came flying in through the bullet hole that was blown out through the wall. She could barely keep herself up. Exhausted from the trek, this ladybug stumbled through the air, steering her way onto my hand. Hanging from my thumb, she waited beside the knife and I. What happened to you? asked the ladybug, trying to catch her breath. We need to rest. We need to stop. She was so tired, just like I, and all I managed to do was find one last tear. The water slipped down my cheek and landed on my hand for the ladybug to sip on, but after that, I was dry inside. There was nothing left for either of us when the ladybug began to levitate in front of me. The little bug inched toward my iris. Do you know why life is beautiful? asked the ladybug. She was so close to my eye that I couldn't see the screen, the knife, or even the room at all. All I could see was her body in front of my eye. Because even when you've got nothing left, hope waits with you to the very end, whispered the ladybug, and I hope things can change. Landing on my pupil, the ladybug's legs held on to my eye. Her body covered the entire view of the television, and she wouldn't let go. She was hanging on for her life. Wait, she was hanging on for mine. How come by the end of it, life takes everything? And in case you're curious, just about everything goes through your mind when you're frozen in between life and death. Once you stop panicking, you'll find that the body stops moving. That's why I was lying so still on the floor. Only after everything stops working do you remember that you have to die just like everyone else. Oh, but what a shameful way to go. And when will I feel it? Then where do I go? I felt an extractor grab onto my ankles and pull my body down the hallway. The mind couldn't speak, and once he pulled me up to the bin labeled rubbish, I felt the sun at its peak. He lifted my body on the side of the pyramid while fresh air whisked on by. 
dangling on the outer edge, my eye peeked up and saw the top of the pyramid pointing up to the blue sky. The extractor held me against the edge, his hands on my feet, my body dangling from that ledge. But what about my memories? And what about my other friends? I promise I'll go quietly. But this can't be the end. Let it go, said a voice. And where am I going? This time the extractor let go of me, and I had no identity left when the wind passed by. Shh, <laughs> with us, it whispered. Living slowly, I lost my name. A setting sun, no wick for my flame. A shadow swooped overhead when I crashed into the garbage below. A cloaked body with the head of a deer descended next to me. The white and black hands latched onto my body when the 28th psychopomp held me against his chest. Time to die said the 28th Psychopomp. Chapter 21 Die, Ego, Die A soul was looking down upon me. One eye was gone, one eye was closed, but I felt the presence of someone nearby while a waterfall splashed down in the distance. Water. I could feel the water rushing by even though we were so far away. And if this was the end, then death was like a stream flowing out of this place. We were deep in the forest when the 28th Psychopomp laid my body upon a rock and began reciting a ritual. As birth begins, so death do we depart. Head home, my dear soul, go back to the start. Let go at death, this means you've conquered the great fear. This is not the ending, a new beginning is here, said the 28th Psychopomp. Wind hushed his voice silent as more animals crept in from the outskirts of the trees. Leaves shuffled beside my ear when a four-legged creature scampered beside my face. A wet nose sniffed my temple before it pressed its head against my neck. It's not gone, but it's not well either. Can we save it? asked the black wolf. His body is done. He's gone as far as he could go, but its mind won't let go yet. It needs to let go, said the 28th psychopomp. Why hold on? He's been destroyed. And how is it even alive? asked the wolf. Don't know, said the psychopomp. Never found a soul quite like his. These animals were speaking of my condition, and their whispers carried with the wind. Why does it have to die? whispered one of the young rabbits. Shh, said its mother. It needs to let go. It suffered enough. All the animals were standing around, and I could feel each presence glowing with the energy of the psychopomp. Like orbs of light dangling around me, each light was housed inside the skin of a body, and each body was unique. Then one familiar creature moved through the crowd when I knew I'd felt his light before. I know this man. We've met, said an opossum. Voices shuffled while the breeze carried the last of the sunlight over the treetops. A dark void was swallowing the sky, and with every passing moment my senses began to slip away. I think its heart is still beating, said the opossum, putting its paw on my chest. I think, I think you should back away, interrupted the psychopomp. I know what happened, and it's better if this one dies. Don't listen to him, whispered the opossum. Hold on if you're still in there. The opossum turned toward the crowd of animals and began to speak. We must do something. Prepare the tiger's ball, and I'll start the sacred ohm. The voice of the opossum was familiar, like an old friend I hadn't seen in years. Lemon and ginger, said the rat, scurrying into leaves. We know where it grows. Ginseng and sage, whispered the boar as it trotted away. I'll bring the valerian root, said the doves as they flew over the woods. I'll take to the yucca, said the fox, and I'll tell the turtles to bring cattails. Red juniper and hawkweed grows beneath the berries, said the raccoons. We'll be back at once. A mad dash of feet scampered with the west wind. I saw golden seal where the blue corn grows, said the owl. And tell the horses to pull green briar, interrupted the caterpillar. All the animals were hustling. Leaves were trampled in every direction as they set off through the land. We'll carry the water for cleansing, said the pelicans. What else is there, Cicero? asked the black wolf. Cat's claw, ashwagandha, mugwort, aloe, orange or gosi, and St. John's wort, said the opossum. Honey locust wouldn't hurt, and we'll need a plant's last breath out too. The plant's last breath? You mean the stone-cold moss agate, said the wolf. I've heard birds whisper how pebbles settle on the ridge of the mountain. I will go. Then make way. He doesn't have much time, said Cicero. We'll need all of it if there's any hope. 
The night fell upon me like bedsheets and covers, and when the giant black abyss stretched dark over my mind, I felt the opossum's light beside me as I continued to fade. Hold on, whispered Cicero. Can you hold on a little longer? Something was pulling at me now. I thought it was the opossum, but it was tugging at my soul. Beginning in my feet and wrapping itself through the legs, I felt my toes go empty. The emptiness began to roll up through my legs and enter the base of my spine. He's leaving, said the psychopomp. Not yet, said Cicero. Start the alm. There was no mistake when I heard the sacred sound. The vibration started with the opossum beside my ear before tiny insects, crickets, and even earthworms were adding their own distinctive tone. Grasshoppers chimed in, then toads began to chant. The geckos held the flow before the alligators started to pant. My soul held on like the last leaf before winter as the animals came back piling the ingredients together. The opossum mashed his feet and paws over the herbs as smells drifted to my senses. When the remedy was ready, the animals pressed it into a paste before the wolf entered the circle offering up what looked like a plant's breath caught in a clear stone. The breath out, said the wolf, I found the moss agate. The wolf dropped the stone beside the pile and a magnetic pulse shot through the land. My mind sprung open. I was aware of the void sucking me under. They placed the stone above my heart when I heard it beat. Pelicans poured water over the gem and air spread through my body. The stone was magic and it gave a breath into my lungs. It's working, said the opossum. Strip the human and apply the remedy, said the wolf. You don't know what it's been through, said the psychopomp. The soul cannot recover once the mind breaks. I see his body fighting, but the mind already cracked. The one is calling him home, and it's too late to bring his body back. But I feel two souls in this man, said Cicero. One was born with the Mokli, but the other is Mahkali Jack. Silence captivated the wind, while a human body lay bare before the stars. The tiger's balm was pressed over my skin, onto every limb, and into every bloody wound, including my missing eye. As the crickets and frogs began to soften their ohm, I began to wonder who was left to take their place. Then the pelicans appeared with more water to replenish every animal's taste. Just as the night was peaking, after none of the creatures dared to quit, I decided that neither could I when the opossum began praying beside my hip. Do you remember how to endure? We can wait, wait and see, whispered Cicero. Mint was seeping through my veins, into every cut, but was it enough? Wet moss was draped over my body before they wrapped me in leaves. Leeches crawled through the dirt and began cleaning the wounds I couldn't see. The ohm, it must go on, said the opossum. If he is to survive the night, the ohm must not stop. Large animals came to lie beside me when the night got cool, and as one species would fade from the ohm, a new pack would chime in while the last group caught their breath. As each pack's contribution ended, another pack of animals would howl through the night. Even when the animals grew weary, a new breed brought the sacred ohm back to life. An offering of hope, a ritual so sincere, but when I couldn't hold on any longer, I knew the ending was here. Then the psychopomp came to stand beside me, and all the animals knew it to be so. I've been home to the source, and there's nothing to be afraid of. Why not let go? said the psychopomp. And what about that? said the opossum, pointing at the giant pyramid across the way. What happens when the humans release their sin into nature? It's happened before. Cicero kept a paw on my chest. Standing between the psychopomp and I, this opossum held his ground when the wind began to howl. Let go, said the 28th psychopomp. This man is our only hope, said the opossum. He's the only creature left to reason with the humans. But I cannot choose who lives and who dies. I'm just a traveler, and I've come to carry the soul home, said the psychopomp. So you've seen the one? You know it to be real, asked the opossum. It is said the 28th psychopomp. Then the one can save him. Take him there before it's too late, and the one will revive his body, said Cicero. The animals passed whispers as hope began to grow. You don't understand. I'm a fairy man, but the journey home requires death, said the psychopomp. Now all the animals were silent. But this man must live, said Cicero. I was there inside the pyramid walls, and I've seen what it's like. Death is coming to us all if we don't stand up and fight. Not a cricket spoke when my spirit began curling up through my spine for the very last time. 
The ohm was gone, and even the air waited still. You're almost there, whispered the psychopomp. There was a feeling in my third eye when I watched it release. So there's no more hope, asked the little ladybug. He's on his last, said the psychopomp. Wait, said the opossum. You said the journey home to the one requires death. Yes, death is required, said the psychopomp. Then take mine and bring his body back, said the opossum. Cicero took off sprinting into the brush toward the nearby pond. What? An exchange won't work. It's not something I've tried. You don't understand, said the psychopomp. A moose tried to block the opossum, but Cicero slid underneath it and dove between its legs, crashing into the waterfall. I've never taken a real body back. I don't think it can pass where we're going, said the psychopomp. Air bubbles rippled across the pond, but Cicero never returned. A black abyss vibrated because I felt its light fading. Aware of his presence, I watched his light dying just like mine. Now the 28th psychopomp reached into his pocket and revealed a serpentine stone. Grabbing hold of my body, he pressed the greenish gem against my heart and took off flying towards the pond. If he's willing to die, then even I must try. Rebirth, said the psychopomp. I was deep in the psychopomp's arms when we descended into the water. All I could feel was the light of the serpentine stone in his hand as he reached toward the opossum. Cicero was never coming up. His body was pinned under the largest rock when the psychopomp's white palm took hold of him before the great white light blinded us all. Then it turned blue. A tunnel began to sprout. And I think we were going in, or maybe this was out. I was so far gone, so lost, and moving so fast that I can't remember anything. I was just over there, and now I'm...